Thank you. Well, it's frightening how commonplace social media is today. I remember when I was 10 or 11, uh, playtime meant cycling or running around outside, and yet this is what playtime is today. To me, this is a convincing demonstration of the power of social media and how it has spread to almost every aspect of our lives. When children of a young age adopt a new pastime without even thinking about it or uh, contemplating what it means, we know that a revolutionary change of the status quo is happening. And that term revolutionary is thrown around a lot. But social media really is a revolution because it's changing the global broadcast communication model, the way we communicate with people across the world. See, for the first time in history, the everyday man or woman can reach an audience of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. And this has never been possible before. Before the uh, spread of social media, this was the global broadcast communication model. A few professionals using radio, television, and print communicating with us, the listeners. And the um, direction of communication was one way, professionals to us. And it was very expensive, and it continues to be expensive. You need uh, studios, cameras, uh, directors, microphones, etc. It's too expensive to broadcast a casual message. But with social media, we are all simultaneously listeners and broadcasters. All you need to send a message is an internet connection. The cost of sending a message is zero. And what this means is that people are prepared to send out messages on any topic. This has never been possible before. Your capacity to reach a large audience is no longer dependent on your ability to um, finance the uh, sending of such a message. All you need is interesting content. So loosely speaking, uh, the more time you have, the, more, uh, the bigger your audience will be, as long as you are contributing interesting content. There is no other cost associated. Think about it. Um, Stephen Fry, for example, is Twitter's, one of Twitter's most popular uh, users. How does his cost of sending a message differ from mine? It really doesn't. And what this means is that people will and do uh, send out messages on almost any topic. This is my favorite tweet, for example. My greatest fear is sitting in, front, in front of thousands of people while my Google search history is being read aloud. OK, so this is a, a funny little statement, but think about it. It's actually useless. This message carries no information. Before the invention of social media, before it spread into every aspect of our lives, it was impossible to broadcast such a message. And yet somebody did, and hundreds of thousands of people have read it. Think about it. Would a seasoned television producer be allowed to waste company airtime on something as useless as this? No. And when you realize that social media is a huge source of information, 175 million tweets a day, for example, that's 2,000 per second. And that's just Twitter. There are hundreds of other social media outlets. And if you count blogs, it's actually in the millions. You begin to appreciate social media as a huge data source on almost any aspect of human existence. So fine, the, um, it, the, the pool of information is polluted with, with junk messages, as I've just shown you. But if you filter that junk out, what you're left with is information that is really meaningful. It's time stamped, so you know when it was sent. It's geo-stamped, so you know where it was sent from. And if you are able to collect it and analyze it, you can actually start to look into the future. And that's what we do um, here at the financial computing department at, at UCL. We've built a platform called SocialStorm. And it is a social media data collector and analytics platform. And it's got two main purposes. First of all, it records publicly available social media data, so no private messages, but things from Twitter, uh, wall posts from Facebook. It records it, and that's very important because there's so much information that the social media outlets don't let you access historic information. Shortly after being created, it's deleted. There's just too much of it to offer to the users. 
The second thing that this platform does is it acts like a huge filter for information. We can specify which sources to look at, in which languages, um, where the data comes from, and whether we look at historic data or live data. If you set up the system correctly, what you're left with is meaningful output from social media data. And this is just one example of the sorts of um, social media analytics systems that are popping up all over the place. Let me give you an example of how you can actually look into the future. Let's um, say that, for example, we have identified a growing number of tweets coming from London that mention flu-like symptoms. We then notice that in comparison to the rest of the UK, there is a growing number of these flu tweets spreading from London through to the south of the UK. So fine, this is a, a very simplified example, but um, such analysis lets epidemiologists track the spread of disease in real time. And there are very complex and advanced tools out there that actually do this. You can think of this as a um, real-time map of the spread of flu through the UK. Before the availability of social media, this wasn't really possible because you needed to conduct surveys, interview patients, look at patient records. It meant that tracking the spread of disease in real time was very difficult, very costly, and most importantly, time intensive. The second thing that you, can, that you can infer from this is that if you extrapolate existing data, you have a basis for suggesting where the flu may spread to in the future. And there are um, services out there that do just this. For example, um, the University of Tokyo has developed a system called Case Mill. And it is just like SocialStorm or any other uh, social media analytics system, a giant filter of information. But it goes one step further. What it does is it listens to tweets that mention flu somehow. But it's able to differentiate between people who suffer from the flu, people who have flu-like symptoms but don't actually suffer from the flu, and people who are simply talking about the flu. It then superimposes all this data onto a 3D map and it lets um, epidemiologists actually track where the flu is spreading to in real time and prepare for it. This has never been possible before. So these um, approaches require the extrapolation of existing data. Another way to um, see into the future with social media data is through group consensus analysis. So for example, let's say we've identified one Facebook post that someone uh, wrote about the next Batman movie. That one post means nothing. But if you are able to look at thousands of posts that are all on the same topic from different data sources, and then you analyze that data together, what you find is that this um, data starts to have some meaning. You can, start to be able to start, you can start to look into the future. For example, with this um, Batman movie t uh, post and the other posts relating to, uh, to the film, uh, if, you if you collect all those um, text, let's call them text snippets, and you pass them through a sentiment um, analysis system, so you rank the text numerically based on its sentiment from very negative to very positive, and you collect all the data together, you might end up with something like this. So in this example, we can say that the sentiment, or the world sentiment on the next Batman movie, even though it hasn't come out yet, is largely positive, which is great. What if it were negative? What if uh, it was the red bar that was the bigger one? Well, that would suggest that the um, financier, that would suggest to the financiers and the distributors of the film that perhaps a better marketing strategy is needed. Um, this is not something that has been possible before. And this um, approach to analyzing the group consensus sentiment on a particular topic can be applied to almost anything that social media users may have an opinion on. For example, there is a, a growing number of publications that show that social media posts on a particular company predict the future direction of the stock price of that company. So for example, 10,000 people talking about IBM, if you analyze all that data, you find out the sentiment of all those um, messages, you put it together, you find that it actually precedes the, uh, the stock market. What's even more fascinating is that it's not even 
necessary to look at social media messages that have anything to do with finance at all. If you take um, messages on any and all topics, you find the sentiment of them, you add it all up together, you find that you can predict the direction of diversified financial products, such as um, stock market, sorry, stock indice, indice index trackers. So in other words, you are taking a snapshot of the mood of the internet. This is an approximation for the mood of the world. And that mood of the world predicts the direction of stock markets, such as uh, stock indices, such as the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And um, this is where we are right now. We are starting to look at um, social media analytics. The way I see it, the internet has undergone um, three evolutionary steps. A graphical user interface has given birth to social media as we know it. And right now, it's undergoing an amalgamation phase. So all the social media outlets are interlinked. You post something on Twitter, it comes out on your Facebook. You write something on a blog, it comes out on your LinkedIn. This is where we are right now. And people are predominantly concerned with contributing to the pool of information. The next evolution of the internet is the analysis of this data. And um, you might find that it'll be both professional institutions, so companies, universities that analyze this data, but also that each individual social media user will be his or her own um, individual analyst. You might find that it's your phone that tells you how your friends are feeling, whether they are sad or happy or angry or anxious, what movie your phone thinks you should watch based on what your friends are saying without you even asking them. It will just tell you. And I'd like to leave you with one final thought. Is all of this social media stuff really necessary? Is it actually contributing to society in a positive way? See, for the first time in history, the everyday man or woman can reach a global audience. And these messages can potentially influence the future. But at what cost? If you look around, everyone's always staring at a phone or some sort of device in the palm of their hand, even when they're with friends or colleagues or relatives. So instead of communicating with them, you're actually trying to communicate with people across the world. And surely that's not healthy. I saw this at a party recently, and it made me think that perhaps Social media is, uh, we, we focus on social media a bit too much. We need to strike some sort of balance. We need to analyze and look at what social media gives us, but also what it takes away. Thank you.